Chapter 30 Plant Form and Physiology 30.1 The plant body By the end of this section, you will be able to do the following. Describe the shoot organ system and the root organ system. Distinguish between meristematic tissue and permanent tissue. Identify and describe the three regions where plant growth occurs. Summarize the roles of dermal tissue, vascular tissue, and ground tissue. Compare simple plant tissue with complex plant tissue like animals. Plants contain cells with organelles in which specific metabolic activities take place. Unlike figure 30.1 a locust leaf consists of leaflets arrayed along a central midrib. Each leaflet is a complex photosynthetic machine, exquisitely adapted to capture sunlight and carbon dioxide. An intricate vascular system supplies the leaf with water and minerals, and exports the products of photosynthesis. Credit. Modification of work by Todd Petit. Introduction plants are as essential to human existence as land, water, and air. Without plants, our day-to-day -day lives would be impossible because without oxygen from photosynthesis, aerobic life cannot be sustained. From providing food and shelter to serving as a source of medicines, oils, perfumes, and industrial products, plants provide humans with numerous valuable resources. When you think of plants, most of the organisms that come to mind are vascular plants. These plants have tissues that conduct food and water, and most of them have seeds. Seed plants are divided into gymnosperms and angiosperms. Gymnosperms include the needle-leaved conifers, spruce, fir, and pine, as well as less familiar plants, such as ginkgos and cycads. Their seeds are not enclosed by a fleshy fruit. Angiosperms, also called flowering plants, constitute the majority of seed plants. They include broad-leaved trees, such as maple, oak, and elm, vegetables, such as potatoes, lettuce, and carrots, grasses, and plants known for the beauty of their flowers, roses, irises, and daffodils, for example. While individual plant species are unique, all share a common structure, a plant body consisting of stems, roots, and leaves. They all transport water, minerals, and sugars produced through photosynthesis through the plant body in a similar manner. All plant species also respond to environmental factors, such as light, gravity, competition, temperature, and predation. Chapter Outline 30.1 The Plant Body 30.2 Stems 30.3 Roots 30.4 Leaves 30.5 Transport of Water and Solutes in Plants 30.6 Plant Sensory Systems and Responses Animals, however, plants use energy from sunlight to form sugars during photosynthesis. In addition, plant cells have cell walls, plastids, and a large central vacuole. Structures that are not found in animal cells. Each of these cellular structures plays a specific role in plant structure and function. Link to learning watch botany without borders. HTTP colon slash slash openstacks.org slash l slash botany underscore wo underscore board closing parenthesis. A video produced by the Botanical Society of America about the importance of plants. Plant organ systems in plants, just as in animals, similar cells working together form a tissue. When different types of tissues work together to perform a unique function, they form an organ. Organs working together form organ systems. Vascular plants have two distinct organ systems, a shoot system, and a root system. The shoot system consists of two portions, the vegetative, non-reproductive, parts of the plant, such as the leaves and the stems, and the reproductive parts of the plant, which include flowers and fruits. The shoot system generally grows above ground, where it absorbs the light needed for photosynthesis. The root system, which supports the plants and absorbs water and minerals, is usually underground. Figure 30.2 shows the organ systems of a typical plant. Figure 30.2 The shoot system of a plant consists of leaves, stems, flowers, and fruits. The root system anchors the plant while absorbing water and minerals from the soil. Plant tissues Plants are multicellular eukaryotes with tissue systems made of various cell types that carry out specific functions. Plant tissue systems fall into one of two general types, meristematic tissue, and permanent, or non-meristematic, tissue. Cells of the meristematic tissue are found in meristems, which are plant regions of continuous cell division and growth. Meristematic tissue cells are either indifferentiated or incompletely differentiated, and they continue to divide and contribute to the growth of the plant. In contrast, permanent tissue consists of plant cells that are no longer actively dividing. Meristematic tissues consist of three types, based on their location in the plant. 
Apical meristems contain meristematic tissue located at the tips of stems and roots, which enable a plant to extend in length. Lateral 830 Chapter 30, Plant Form and Physiology Access for free at OpenStax.org. Meristems facilitate growth in thickness or girth in a maturing plant. Intercalary meristems occur only in monocots, at the bases of leaf blades and at nodes, the areas where leaves attach to a stem. This tissue enables the monocot leaf blade to increase in length from the leaf base. For example, it allows lawn grass leaves to elongate even after repeated mowing. Meristems produce cells that quickly differentiate, or specialize, and become permanent tissue. Such cells take on specific roles and lose their ability to divide further. They differentiate into three main types, dermal, vascular, and ground tissue. Dermal tissue covers and protects the plant, and vascular tissue transports water, minerals, and sugars to different parts of the plant. Ground tissue serves as a site for photosynthesis, provides a supporting matrix for the vascular tissue, and helps to store water and sugars. Secondary tissues are either simple, composed of similar cell types, or complex, composed of different cell types. Dermal tissue, for example, is a simple tissue that covers the outer surface of the plant and controls gas exchange. Vascular tissue is an example of a complex tissue, and is made of two specialized conducting tissues, xylem and phloem. Xylem tissue transports water and nutrients from the roots to different parts of the plant, and includes three different cell types, vessel elements and tracheids, both of which conduct water, and xylem parenchyma. Phloem tissue, which transports organic compounds from the site of photosynthesis to other parts of the plant, consists of four different cell types. Sieve cells, which conduct photosynthates, companion cells, phloem parenchyma, and phloem fibers. Unlike xylem conducting cells, phloem conducting cells are alive at maturity. The xylem and phloem always lie adjacent to each other, figure 30.3. In stems, the xylem and the phloem form a structure called a vascular bundle. In roots, this is termed the vascular steel or vascular cylinder. Figure 30.3 This light micrograph shows a cross-section of a squash, Curcurbita maxima, stem. Each teardrop-shaped vascular bundle consists of large xylem vessels toward the inside and smaller phloem cells toward the outside. Xylem cells, which transport water and nutrients from the roots to the rest of the plant, are dead at functional maturity. Phloem cells, which transport sugars and other organic compounds from photosynthetic tissue to the rest of the plant, are living. The vascular bundles are encased in ground tissue and surrounded by dermal tissue. Credit. Modification of work by Biophotos, Flickr. Scale bar data from Matt Russell. 30.2 stems by the end of this section. You will be able to do the following. Describe the main function and basic structure of stems. Compare and contrast the roles of dermal tissue, vascular tissue, and ground tissue. Distinguish between primary growth and secondary growth in stems. Summarize the origin of annual rings. List and describe examples of modified stem stems are a part of the shoot system of a plant. They may range in length from a few millimeters to hundreds of meters, and also vary in diameter, depending on the plant type. Stems are usually above ground, although the stems of some plants, such as the potato, also grow underground. Stems may be herbaceous, soft, or woody in nature. Their main function is to provide support to 30.2, stems 831 the plant, holding leaves, flowers and buds. In some cases, stems also store food for the plant. A stem may be unbranched, like that of a palm tree, or it may be highly branched, like that of a magnolia tree. The stem of the plant connects the roots to the leaves, helping to transport absorbed water and minerals to different parts of the plant. It also helps to transport the products of photosynthesis, namely sugars, from the leaves to the rest of the plant. Plant stems, whether above or below ground, are characterized by the presence of nodes and internodes, figure 30.4. Nodes are points of attachment for leaves, aerial roots, and flowers. The stem region between two nodes is called an internode. The stalk that extends from the stem to the base of the leaf is the petiole. An axillary bud is usually found in the axle, the area between the base of a leaf and the stem, where it can give rise to a branch or a flower. The apex, tip, of the shoot contains the apical meristem within the apical bud. Figure 30.4 leaves are attached to the plant stem at areas called nodes. An internode is the stem region between two nodes. 
The petiole is the stalk connecting the leaf to the stem. The leaves just above the nodes arose from axillary buds. Stem anatomy The stem and other plant organs arise from the ground tissue, and are primarily made up of simple tissues formed from three types of cells, parenchyma, calenchyma, and sclerenchyma cells. Parenchyma cells are the most common plant cells, figure 30.5. They are found in the stem, the root, the inside of the leaf, and the pulp of the fruit. Parenchyma cells are responsible for metabolic functions, such as photosynthesis, and they help repair and heal wounds. Some parenchyma cells also store starch. 832 Chapter 30, Plant Form and Physiology Access for free at OpenStax.org. Figure 30.5 The stem of common St. John's wort, Hypericum perforatum, is shown in cross-section in this light micrograph. The central pith, greenish-blue, in the center, and peripheral cortex, narrow zone 3 to 5 cells thick just inside the epidermis, are composed of parenchyma cells. Vascular tissue composed of xylem, red, and phloem tissue, green, between the xylem and cortex, surrounds the pith. Credit. Rolf Dieter Muller, Kalinkima cells are elongated cells with unevenly thickened walls, figure 30.6. They provide structural support, mainly to the stem and leaves. These cells are alive at maturity and are usually found below the epidermis. The strings of a celery stalk are an example of Kalinkima cells. Figure 30.6 Kalinkima cell walls are uneven in thickness, as seen in this light micrograph. They provide support to plant structures. Credit. Modification of work by Carl Schursky. Scale bar data from Matt Russell. Sclerenchyma cells also provide support to the plant, but unlike Kalinkima cells, many of them are dead at maturity. There are two types of sclerenchyma cells, fibers and scleriads. Both types have secondary cell walls that are thickened with deposits of lignin, an organic compound that is a key component of wood. Fibers are long, slender cells. Scleriads are smaller sized. Scleriads give pears their gritty texture. Humans use sclerenchyma fibers to make linen and rope, figure 30.7. 30.2, stems 833 visual connection figure 30.7 The central pith and outer cortex of the a, flax stem are made up of parenchyma cells. Inside the cortex is a layer of sclerenchyma cells, which make up the fibers in flax rope and clothing. Humans have grown and harvested flax for thousands of years. In B, this drawing, 14th century women prepare linen. The C, flax plant is grown and harvested for its fibers, which are used to weave linen, and for its seeds, which are the source of linseed oil. Credit a modification of work by Emmanuel Boutte based on original work by Ryan R. McKenzie. Credit C, modification of work by Brian Durth. Scale bar data from Matt Russell. Which layers of the stem are made of parenchyma cells? A. Cortex and pith B. Flow MC. Sclerenchyma D. Xylem like the rest of the plant, the stem has three tissue systems, dermal, vascular, and ground tissue. Each is distinguished by characteristic cell types that perform specific tasks necessary for the plant's growth and survival. Dermal tissue The dermal tissue of the stem consists primarily of epidermis, a single layer of cells covering and protecting the underlying tissue. Woody plants have a tough, waterproof outer layer of cork cells commonly known as bark, which further protects the plant from damage. Epidermal cells are the most numerous and least differentiated of the cells in the epidermis. The epidermis of a leaf also contains openings known as stomata, through which the exchange of gases takes place, figure 30.8. Two cells, known as guard cells, surround each leaf stoma controlling its opening and closing and thus regulating the uptake of carbon dioxide and the release of oxygen and water vapor. Trichomes are hair-like structures on the epidermal surface. They help to reduce transpiration, the loss of water by above-ground plant parts, increase solar reflectance, and store compounds that defend the leaves against predation by herbivores. 834 Chapter 30, Plant Form and Physiology Access for free at OpenStax.org. Figure 30.8 Openings called stomata, singular. Stoma, allow a plant to take up carbon dioxide and release oxygen and water vapor. The, a, uh, colorized scanning electron micrograph shows a closed stoma of a dacot. Each stoma is flanked by two guard cells that regulate its, b, opening and closing. The, c, guard cells sit within the layer of epidermal cells. Credit a, 
Modification of work by Louisa Howard, Ripple Electron Microscope Facility, Dartmouth College. Credit B. Modification of work by June Kwok, University of Maryland. Scale bar data from Matt Russell. Vascular tissue the xylem and phloem that make up the vascular tissue of the stem are arranged in distinct strands called vascular bundles, which run up and down the length of the stem. When the stem is viewed in cross-section, the vascular bundles of Dicot stems are arranged in a ring. In plants with stems that live for more than one year, the individual bundles grow together and produce the characteristic growth rings. In monocot stems, the vascular bundles are randomly scattered throughout the ground tissue, figure 30.9. Figure 30.9 in, a, decot stems, vascular bundles are arranged around the periphery of the ground tissue. The xylem tissue is located toward the interior of the vascular bundle, and phloem is located toward the exterior. Sclerenchyma fibers cap the vascular bundles. In, b, monocot stems, Vascular bundles composed of xylem and phloem tissues are scattered throughout the ground tissue. Xylem tissue has three types of cells, xylem parenchyma, tracheids, and vessel elements. The latter two types conduct water and are dead at maturity. Tracheids are xylem cells with thick secondary cell walls that are lignified. Water moves from one tracheid to another through regions on the side walls known as pits, where secondary walls are absent. Vessel elements are xylem cells with thinner walls, they are shorter than tracheids. Each vessel element is connected to the next by means of a perforation plate at the end walls of the element. Water moves through the perforation plates to travel up the plant. 30.2, stems 835 phloem tissue is composed of sieve tube cells, companion cells, phloem parenchyma, and phloem fibers. A series of sieve tube cells, also called sieve tube elements, are arranged end to end to make up a long sieve tube, which transports organic substances such as sugars and amino acids. The sugars flow from one sieve tube cell to the next through perforated sieve plates, which are found at the end junctions between two cells. Although still alive at maturity, the nucleus and other cell components of the sieve tube cells have disintegrated. Companion cells are found alongside the sieve tube cells, providing them with metabolic support. The companion cells contain more ribosomes and mitochondria than the sieve tube cells, which lack some cellular organelles. Ground tissue Ground tissue is mostly made up of parenchyma cells, but may also contain collinchyma and sclerenchyma cells that help support the stem. The ground tissue towards the interior of the vascular tissue in a stem or root is known as pith, while the layer of tissue between the vascular tissue and the epidermis is known as the cortex. Growth in stems Growth in plants occurs as the stems and roots lengthen. Some plants, especially those that are woody, also increase in thickness during their lifespan. The increase in length of the shoot and the root is referred to as primary growth, and is the result of cell division in the shoot apical meristem. Secondary growth is characterized by an increase in thickness or girth of the plant, and is caused by cell division in the lateral meristem. Figure 30.10 shows the areas of primary and secondary growth in a plant. Herbaceous plants mostly undergo primary growth, with hardly any secondary growth or increase in thickness. Secondary growth or wood is noticeable in woody plants. It occurs in some dicots, but occurs very rarely in monocots. Figure 30.10 in woody plants. Primary growth is followed by secondary growth, which allows the plant stem to increase in thickness or girth. Secondary vascular tissue is added as the plant grows, as well as a cork layer. The bark of a tree extends from the vascular cambium to the epidermis. Some plant parts, such as stems and roots, continue to grow throughout a plant's life, a phenomenon called indeterminate growth. Other plant parts, such as leaves and flowers, exhibit determinate growth, which ceases when a plant part reaches a particular size. Primary growth Most primary growth occurs at the apices, or tips, of stems and roots. Primary growth is a result of rapidly dividing cells in the apical meristems at the shoot tip and root tip. Subsequent cell elongation also contributes to primary growth. The growth of shoots and roots during primary growth enables plants to continuously seek water, roots, or sunlight, shoots. The influence of the apical bud on overall plant growth is known as apical dominance which diminishes the growth of axillary buds that form along the sides of branches and stems. Most coniferous trees exhibit strong apical dominance, thus producing 836 chapter 30, 
plant form and physiology access for free at OpenStax.org. The typical conical Christmas tree shape. If the apical bud is removed, then the axillary buds will start forming lateral branches. Gardeners make use of this fact when they prune plants by cutting off the tops of branches, thus encouraging the axillary buds to grow out, giving the plant a bushy shape. Link to learning watch this BBC Nature video, http colon slash slash openstacks.org slash l slash motion underscore plants closing parenthesis showing how time-lapse photography captures plant growth at high speed. Secondary growth The increase in stem thickness that results from secondary growth is due to the activity of the lateral meristems, which are lacking in herbaceous plants. Lateral meristems include the vascular cambium and, in woody plants, the cork cambium. See figure 30.10. The vascular cambium is located just outside the primary xylem and to the interior of the primary phloem. The cells of the vascular cambium divide and form secondary xylem tracheids and vessel elements, to the inside, and secondary phloem, sieve elements and companion cells, to the outside. The thickening of the stem that occurs in secondary growth is due to the formation of secondary phloem and secondary xylem by the vascular cambium, plus the action of cork cambium, which forms the tough outermost layer of the stem. The cells of the secondary xylem contain lignin, which provides hardiness and strength. In woody plants, cork cambium is the outermost lateral meristem. It produces cork cells, bark, containing a waxy substance known as suberin that can repel water. The bark protects the plant against physical damage and helps reduce water loss. The cork cambium also produces a layer of cells known as felliderm, which grows inward from the cambium. The cork cambium, cork cells, and felliderm are collectively termed the periderm. The periderm substitutes for the epidermis in mature plants. In some plants, the periderm has many openings, known as lenticels, which allow the interior cells to exchange gases with the outside atmosphere, figure 30.11. This supplies oxygen to the living and metabolically active cells of the cortex, xylem, and phloem. Figure 30.11 lenticels on the bark of this cherry tree enable the woody stem to exchange gases with the surrounding atmosphere. Credit. Roger Griffith, annual rings The activity of the vascular cambium gives rise to annual growth rings. During the spring growing season, cells of the secondary xylem have a large internal diameter and their primary cell walls are not extensively thickened. This is known as early wood, or spring wood. During the fall season, the secondary xylem develops thickened cell walls, forming late wood, or autumn wood, which is denser than early wood. This alternation of early and late wood is due largely to a seasonal decrease in the number of 30.2, stems 837 vessel elements and a seasonal increase in the number of tracheids. It results in the formation of an annual ring, which can be seen as a circular ring in the cross-section of the stem, figure 30.12. An examination of the number of annual rings and their nature, such as their size and cell wall thickness, can reveal the age of the tree and the prevailing climatic conditions during each season. Figure 30.12 The rate of wood growth increases in summer and decreases in winter, producing a characteristic ring for each year of growth. Seasonal changes in weather patterns can also affect the growth rate. Note how the rings vary in thickness. Credit. Adrian Pingstone, Stem Modification Some plant species have modified stems that are especially suited to a particular habitat and environment. Figure 30.13 a rhizome is a modified stem that grows horizontally underground and has nodes and internodes. Vertical shoots may arise from the buds on the rhizome of some plants, such as ginger and ferns. Corms are similar to rhizomes, except they are more rounded and fleshy, such as in gladiolus. Corms contain stored food that enables some plants to survive the winter. Stolons are stems that run almost parallel to the ground, or just below the surface, and can give rise to new plants at the nodes. Runners are a type of stolon that runs above the ground and produces new clone plants at nodes at varying intervals. Strawberries are an example. Tubers are modified stems that may store starch, as seen in the potato, Solanum sp. Tubers arise as swollen ends of stolons, and contain many adventitious or unusual buds, familiar to us as the eyes on potatoes. A bulb, which functions as an underground storage unit, is a modification of a stem that has the appearance of enlarged fleshy leaves emerging from the stem or surrounding the base of the stem, as seen in the iris. 
Figure 30.13 Stem modifications enable plants to thrive in a variety of environments. Shown are a ginger, Zingiber officinale, rhizomes, b a carrion flower, Amorphophallus titanum, corm, c Rhodes grass, Chloris guiana, stolons, d strawberry, Fragaria ananasa, runners, e potato, Solanum tuberosum, tubers, and f red onion, allium, bulbs. Credit A. Modification of work by Maha Dumat. Credit C. Modification of work by Harry Rose. Credit D. Modification of work by Rebecca Siegel. Credit E. Modification of work by Scott Bauer, USDA Rs. Credit F. 838 Chapter 30, Plant Form and Physiology Access for Free at OpenStax.org. Modification of work by Stephen Osmus, USDA Rs. Link to Learning Watch botanist Wendy Hodgson, of Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix, Arizona. Explain how agave plants were cultivated for food hundreds of years ago in the Arizona desert in this video. HTTP colon slash slash openstax.org slash l slash ancient underscore crop closing parenthesis finding the roots of an ancient crop. Some aerial modifications of stems are tendrils and thorns, figure 30.14. Tendrils are slender, twining strands that enable a plant, like a vine or pumpkin, to seek support by climbing on other surfaces. Thorns are modified branches appearing as sharp outgrowths that protect the plant. Common examples include roses, Osage orange, and devil's walking stick. Figure 30.14 found in southeastern United States. A buckwheat vine, Brunichia ovata, is a weedy plant that climbs with the aid of tendrils. This one is shown climbing up a wooden stake. B. Thorns are modified branches. Credit A. Modification of work by Christopher Meloki, USDA Rs. Credit B. Modification of work by Macrophile, Flicker. 30.3 Roots By the end of this section, you will be able to do the following. Identify the two types of root systems. Describe the three zones of the root tip and summarize the role of each zone in root growth. Describe the structure of the root, list and describe examples of modified roots The roots of seed plants have three major functions. Anchoring the plant to the soil, absorbing water and minerals and transporting them upwards, and storing the products of photosynthesis. Some roots are modified to absorb moisture and exchange gases. Most roots are underground. Some plants, however, also have adventitious roots, which emerge above the ground from the shoot. Types of root systems Root systems are mainly of two types. Figure 30.15. Dicots have a taproot system, while monocots have a fibrous root system. A taproot system has a main root that grows down vertically, and from which many smaller lateral roots arise. Dandelions are a good example. Their taproots usually break off when trying to pull these weeds, and they can regrow another shoot from the remaining root. A taproot system penetrates deep into the soil. In contrast, a fibrous root system is located closer to the soil surface, and forms a dense network of roots that also helps prevent soil erosion. Lawn grasses are a good example, as are wheat, rice, and corn. Some plants have a combination of tap roots and fibrous roots. Plants that grow in dry areas often have deep root systems, whereas plants growing in areas with abundant water are likely to have shallower root systems. 30.3 Roots 839 Figure 30.15, A. Tap root systems have a main root that grows down, while, B. Fibrous root systems consist of many small roots. Credit B. Modification of work by, Austin Squarepants, Flicker, root growth and anatomy root growth begins with seed germination. When the plant embryo emerges from the seed, the radical of the embryo forms the root system. The tip of the root is protected by the root cap a structure exclusive to roots and unlike any other plant structure. The root cap is continuously replaced because it gets damaged easily as the root pushes through soil. The root tip can be divided into three zones, a zone of cell division, a zone of elongation, and a zone of maturation and differentiation, figure 30.16. The zone of cell division is closest to the root tip. It is made up of the actively dividing cells of the root meristem. The zone of elongation is where the newly formed cells increase in length, thereby lengthening the root. Beginning at the first root hair is the zone of cell maturation where the root cells begin to differentiate into special cell types. All three zones are in the first centimeter or so of the root tip. 
Figure 30.16 A longitudinal view of the root reveals the zones of cell division, elongation, and maturation. Cell division occurs in the apical meristem. The root has an outer layer of cells called the epidermis, which surrounds areas of ground tissue and vascular tissue. The 840 Chapter 30 Plant Form and Physiology Access for free at OpenStax.org Epidermis provides protection and helps in absorption. Root hairs, which are extensions of root epidermal cells, increase the surface area of the root, greatly contributing to the absorption of water and minerals. Inside the root, the ground tissue forms two regions, the cortex and the pith, figure 30.17. Compared to stems, roots have lots of cortex and little pith. Both regions include cells that store photosynthetic products. The cortex is between the epidermis and the vascular tissue, whereas the pith lies between the vascular tissue and the center of the root. Figure 30.17 staining reveals different cell types in this light micrograph of a wheat, triticum, root cross-section. Scleranchyma cells of the exodermis and xylem cells stain red, and phloem cells stain blue. Other cell types stain black. The steel, or vascular tissue, is the area inside endodermis, indicated by a green ring. Root hairs are visible outside the epidermis. Credit. Scale bar data from Matt Russell. The vascular tissue in the root is arranged in the inner portion of the root, which is called the steel, figure 30.18. A layer of cells known as the endodermis separates the steel from the ground tissue in the outer portion of the root. The endodermis is exclusive to roots, and serves as a checkpoint for materials entering the root's vascular system. A waxy substance called suberin is present on the walls of the endodermal cells. This waxy region, known as the Casparian strip, forces water and solutes to cross the plasma membranes of endodermal cells instead of slipping between the cells. This ensures that only materials required by the root pass through the endodermis, while toxic substances and pathogens are generally excluded. The outermost cell layer of the root's vascular tissue is the pericycle, an area that can give rise to lateral roots. In decot roots, the xylem and phloem of the steel are arranged alternately in an X shape, whereas in monocot roots, the vascular tissue is arranged in a ring around the pith. Figure 30.18 in, left, typical dicots, the vascular tissue forms an X shape in the center of the root. In, right, typical monocots, the phloem cells and the larger xylem cells form a characteristic ring around the central pith. Root modifications root structures may be modified for specific purposes. For example, some roots are bulbous and store starch. Aerial roots and 30.3, roots 841 prop roots are two forms of above-ground roots that provide additional support to anchor the plant. Tap roots, such as carrots, turnips, and beets, are examples of roots that are modified for food storage, figure 30.19. Figure 30.19 Many vegetables are modified roots. Epiphytic roots enable a plant to grow on another plant. For example, the epiphytic roots of orchids develop a spongy tissue to absorb moisture. The banyan tree, Ficus sp., begins as an epiphyte, germinating in the branches of a host tree. Aerial roots develop from the branches and eventually reach the ground, providing additional support, figure 30.20. In screw pine, Pandanus sp., a palm-like tree that grows in sandy tropical soils, above-ground prop roots develop from the nodes to provide additional support. Figure 30.20 The a, banyan tree, also known as the strangler fig, begins life as an epiphyte in a host tree. Aerial roots extend to the ground and support the growing plant, which eventually strangles the host tree. The b, screw pine develops above-ground roots that help support the plant in sandy soils. Credit a Modification of work by P. Cyber Artist, Flickr. Credit B. Modification of work by David Eikhoff. 30.4 Leaves By the end of this section, you will be able to do the following. Identify the parts of a typical leaf. Describe the internal structure and function of a leaf. Compare and contrast simple leaves and compound leaves. List and describe examples of modified leaves. Leaves are the main sites for photosynthesis. The process by which plants synthesize food. Most leaves are usually green, due to the presence of chlorophyll in the leaf cells. However, some leaves may have different colors, caused by other plant pigments that mask the green chlorophyll. The thickness, shape, and size of leaves are adapted to the environment. 
Each variation helps a plant species maximize its chances of survival in a particular habitat. Usually, the leaves of plants growing in tropical rainforests have larger surface areas than those of plants growing in deserts or very cold conditions, which are likely to have a smaller surface area to minimize water loss. 842 Chapter 30 Plant Form and Physiology Access for Free at OpenStacks.org Structure of a typical leaf Each leaf typically has a leaf blade called the lamina, which is also the widest part of the leaf. Some leaves are attached to the plant stem by a petiole. Leaves that do not have a petiole and are directly attached to the plant stem are called sessile leaves. Small green appendages usually found at the base of the petiole are known as stipples. Most leaves have a midrib, which travels the length of the leaf and branches to each side to produce veins of vascular tissue. The edge of the leaf is called the margin. Figure 30.21 shows the structure of a typical uticot leaf. Figure 30.21 deceptively simple in appearance, a leaf is a highly efficient structure. Within each leaf, the vascular tissue forms veins. The arrangement of veins in a leaf is called the venation pattern. Monocots and dicots differ in their patterns of venation, figure 30.22. Monocots have parallel venation. The veins run in straight lines across the length of the leaf without converging at a point. In dicots, however, the veins of the leaf have a net-like appearance, forming a pattern known as reticulate venation. One extant plant, the ginkgo biloba, has dichotomous venation where the veins fork. Figure 30.22, a tulip, tulipa, a monocot, has leaves with parallel venation. The net-like venation in this, b, linden, tilia cordata, leaf distinguishes it as a dicot. The, c, ginkgo biloba tree has dichotomous venation. Credit a photo. Modification of work by 30.4, leaves 843. Drewboy 64 inches, Wikimedia Commons. Credit B photo. Modification of work by Roger Griffith. Credit C photo. Modification of work by Geisha Boy 500 inches, Flickr. Credit ABC illustrations. Modification of work by Agnieszka Kuisin, Leaf arrangement The arrangement of leaves on a stem is known as philotaxy. The number and placement of a plant's leaves will vary depending on the species, with each species exhibiting a characteristic leaf arrangement. Leaves are classified as either alternate, spiral, or opposite. Plants that have only one leaf per node have leaves that are said to be either alternate, meaning the leaves alternate on each side of the stem in a flat plane, or spiral, meaning the leaves are arrayed in a spiral along the stem. In an opposite leaf arrangement, two leaves arise at the same point, with the leaves connecting opposite each other along the branch. If there are three or more leaves connected at a node, the leaf arrangement is classified as whorled. Leaf form leaves may be simple or compound, figure 30.23. In a simple leaf, the blade is either completely undivided, as in the banana leaf, or it has lobes, but the separation does not reach the midrib, as in the maple leaf. In a compound leaf, the leaf blade is completely divided, forming leaflets, as in the locust tree. Each leaflet may have its own stalk, but is attached to the rotches. A palmately compound leaf resembles the palm of a hand, with leaflets radiating outwards from one point. Examples include the leaves of poison ivy, the buckeye tree, or the familiar houseplant Schifflera sp. Common name, umbrella plant. Pinnately compound leaves take their name from their feather-like appearance. The leaflets are arranged along the midrib, as in rose leaves, rosa sp. Or the leaves of hickory, pecan, ash, or walnut trees. Figure 30.23 leaves may be simple or compound. In simple leaves, the lamina is continuous. The a, banana plant, Musa sp, has simple leaves. In compound leaves, the lamina is separated into leaflets. Compound leaves may be palmate or pinnate. In b, palmately compound leaves, such as those of the horse chestnut, Asculus hippocastinum, the leaflets branch from the petiole. In c, pinnately compound leaves, the leaflets branch from the midrib, as on a scrub hickory, Caria floridana. The D. honey locust has double compound leaves, in which leaflets branch from the veins. Credit A. Modification of work by Baza da Rambler, Flickr. Credit B. Modification of work by Roberto Verzo. Credit C. Modification of work by Eric Dion. Credit D. Modification of work by Valerie Likes. Leaf structure and function The outermost layer of the leaf is the epidermis, 
It is present on both sides of the leaf and is called the upper and lower epidermis, respectively. Botanists call the upper side the adaxial surface, or adaxis, and the lower side the abaxial surface, or abaxis. The epidermis helps in the regulation of gas exchange. It contains stomata, figure 30.24, openings through which the 844 chapter 30, plant form and physiology access for free at openstax.org. Exchange of gases takes place. Two guard cells surround each stoma, regulating its opening and closing. Figure 30.24 visualized at 500x with a scanning electron microscope. Several stomata are clearly visible on a uh, the surface of this sumac RHU's glabra leaf. At 5000x magnification, the guard cells of b a single stoma from lyre leaved sandcress Arabidopsis lorata have the appearance of lips that surround the opening. In this, C, light micrograph cross-section of an A. lorata leaf, the guard cell pair is visible along with the large, substomatal airspace in the leaf. Credit. Modification of work by Robert R. Wise. Part C scale bar data from Matt Russell. The epidermis is usually one cell layer thick. However, in plants that grow in very hot or very cold conditions, the epidermis may be several layers thick to protect against excessive water loss from transpiration. A waxy layer known as the cuticle covers the leaves of all plant species. The cuticle reduces the rate of water loss from the leaf surface. Other leaves may have small hairs, trichomes, on the leaf surface. Trichomes help to deter herbivora by restricting insect movements, or by storing toxic or bad-tasting compounds. They can also reduce the rate of transpiration by blocking airflow across the leaf surface, figure 30.25. Figure 30.25 trichomes give leaves a fuzzy appearance as in this, a, uh, sundew, Drosera sp. Leaf trichomes include, b, branched trichomes on the leaf of Arabidopsis lorata and, c, multibranched trichomes on a mature Quercus marilandica leaf. Credit a, John Freeland. Credit b, c, modification of work by Robert R. Wise. Scale bar data from Matt Russell. Below the epidermis of Dicot leaves are layers of cells known as the mesophyll, or middle leaf. The mesophyll of most leaves typically contains two arrangements of parenchyma cells, the palisade parenchyma and spongy parenchyma, figure 30.26. The palisade parenchyma, also called the palisade mesophyll, has column-shaped, tightly packed cells, and may be present in one, two, or three layers. Below the palisade parenchyma are loosely arranged cells of an irregular shape. These are the cells of the spongy parenchyma, or spongy mesophyll. The airspace found between the spongy parenchyma cells allows gaseous exchange between the leaf and the outside atmosphere through the stomata. In aquatic plants, the intercellular spaces in the spongy parenchyma help the leaf float. Both layers of the mesophyll contain many chloroplasts. Guard cells are the only epidermal cells to contain chloroplasts. 30.4, leaves 845 figure 30.26 in the, uh, leaf drawing, the central mesophyll is sandwiched between an upper and lower epidermis. The mesophyll has two layers, an upper palisade layer comprised of tightly packed, columnar cells, and a lower spongy layer, comprised of loosely packed, irregularly shaped cells. Stomata on the leaf underside allow gas exchange. A waxy cuticle covers all aerial surfaces of land plants to minimize water loss. These leaf layers are clearly visible in the B scanning electron micrograph. The numerous small bumps in the palisade parenchyma cells are chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are also present in the spongy parenchyma, but are not as obvious. The bumps protruding from the lower surface of the leaf are glandular. Trichomes, which differ in structure from the stocked trichomes in figure 30.25. Credit B. Modification of work by Robert R. Wise. Like the stem, the leaf contains vascular bundles composed of xylem and phloem, figure 30.27. The xylem consists of tracheids and vessels, which transport water and minerals to the leaves. The phloem transports the photosynthetic products from the leaf to the other parts of the plant. A single vascular bundle, no matter how large or small, always contains both xylem and phloem tissues. 846 Chapter 30, Plant Form and Physiology Access for free at OpenStax.org. Figure 30.27 This scanning electron micrograph shows xylem and phloem in the leaf vascular bundle from the lyre-leaved sand cress, Arabidopsis lorata. Credit.
Modification of work by Robert R. Wise. Scale bar data from Matt Russell. Leaf adaptations coniferous plant species that thrive in cold environments, like spruce, fir, and pine, have leaves that are reduced in size and needle-like in appearance. These needle-like leaves have sunken stomata and a smaller surface area, two attributes that aid in reducing water loss. In hot climates, plants such as cacti have leaves that are reduced to spines, which in combination with their succulent stems, help to conserve water. Many aquatic plants have leaves with wide lamina that can float on the surface of the water, and a thick waxy cuticle on the leaf surface that repels water. Link to Learning Watch, the Pale Pitcher Plant, episode of the video, http colon slash slash openstacks.org slash l slash plants underscore cool underscore two closing parenthesis series plants are cool, too. A Botanical Society of America video about a carnivorous plant species found in Louisiana. Evolution connection plant adaptations in resource-deficient environments roots, stems, and leaves are structured to ensure that a plant can obtain the required sunlight, water, soil nutrients, and oxygen resources. Some remarkable adaptations have evolved to enable plant species to thrive in less-than-ideal habitats, where one or more of these resources is in short supply. In tropical rainforests, light is often scarce since many trees and plants grow close together and block much of the sunlight from reaching the forest floor. Many tropical plant species have exceptionally broad leaves to maximize the capture of sunlight. Other species are epiphytes, plants that grow on other plants that serve as a physical support. Such plants are able to grow high up in the canopy atop the branches of other trees, where sunlight is more plentiful. Epiphytes live on rain and minerals collected in the branches and leaves of the supporting plant. Bromeliads, members of the pineapple family, ferns, and orchids are examples of tropical epiphytes, figure 30.28. Many epiphytes have specialized tissues that enable them to efficiently capture and store water. 30.4, leaves 847 figure 30.281 of the most well-known bromeliads as Spanish moss, Tillandsia usneoides, seen here in an oak tree. Credit. Christine Paulus. Some plants have special adaptations that help them to survive in nutrient-poor environments. Carnivorous plants, such as the Venus flytrap and the pitcher plant, figure 30.29, grow in bogs where the soil is low in nitrogen. In these plants, leaves are modified to capture insects. The insect capturing leaves may have evolved to provide these plants with a supplementary source of much-needed nitrogen. Figure 30.29 The uh, Venus flytrap has modified leaves that can capture insects. When an unlucky insect touches the trigger hairs inside the leaf, the trap suddenly closes. The opening of the B pitcher plant is lined with a slippery wax. Insects crawling on the lip slip and fall into a pool of water in the bottom of the pitcher, where they are digested by bacteria. The plant then absorbs the smaller molecules. Credit A. Modification of work by Peter Shanks. Credit B. Modification of work by Tim Mansfield. Many swamp plants have adaptations that enable them to thrive in wet areas, where their roots grow submerged underwater. In these aquatic areas, the soil is unstable and little oxygen is available to reach the roots. Trees such as mangroves, Rhizophora sp. Growing in coastal waters produce above-ground roots that help support the tree, figure 30.30. Some species of mangroves, as well as cypress trees, have pneumatophores, upward-growing roots containing pores and pockets of tissue specialized for gas exchange. Wild rice is an aquatic plant with large air spaces in the root cortex. The air-filled tissue, called aranchyma, provides a path for oxygen to diffuse down to the root tips, which are embedded in oxygen-poor bottom sediments. 848 Chapter 30 Plant form and physiology access for free at openstacks.org. Figure 30.30 The branches of a uh, mangrove trees develop aerial roots, which descend to the ground and help to anchor the trees. B. Cypress trees and some mangrove species have upward growing roots called pneumatophores that are involved in gas exchange. Aquatic plants such as C. Wild rice have large spaces in the root cortex called aranchyma, visualized here using scanning electron microscopy. Credit A. Modification of work by Roberto Verzo. Credit B. Modification of work by Dwayne Burdick. Credit C. Modification of work by Robert R. Wise. Link to Learning Watch Venus Flytraps. Jaws of Death.
an extraordinary BBC close-up of the Venus flytrap in action. Click to view content, https colon slash slash www.openstacks.org slash l slash venus underscore flytrap closing parenthesis. 30.5 Transport of water and solutes in plants by the end of this section, you will be able to do the following. Define water potential and explain how it is influenced by solutes, pressure, gravity, and the matrix potential. Describe how water potential, evapotranspiration, and stomatal regulation influence how water is transported in plants. Explain how photosynthates are transported in plants The structure of plant roots, stems, and leaves facilitates the transport of water, nutrients, and photosynthates throughout the plant. The phloem and xylem are the main tissues responsible for this movement. Water potential, evapotranspiration, and stomatal regulation influence how water and nutrients are transported in plants. To understand how these processes work, we must first understand the energetics of water potential. Water potential plants are phenomenal hydraulic engineers. Using only the basic laws of physics and the simple manipulation of potential energy, plants can move water to the top of a 116-meter tall tree, figure 30.31a. Plants can also use hydraulics to generate enough force to split rocks and buckle sidewalks, figure 30.31b. Plants achieve this because of water potential. 30.5. Transport of water and solutes in plants 849 figure 30.31 with heights nearing 116 meters. A coastal redwoods, sequoia sempervirens, are the tallest trees in the world. Plant roots can easily generate enough force to b buckle and break concrete sidewalks, much to the dismay of homeowners and city maintenance departments. Credit a modification of work by Bernd Rostad. Credit B. Modification of work by pedestrians educating drivers on safety, Inc. Water potential is a measure of the potential energy in water. Plant physiologists are not interested in the energy in any one particular aqueous system, but are very interested in water movement between two systems. In practical terms, therefore, water potential is the difference in potential energy between a given water sample and pure water, at atmospheric pressure and ambient temperature. Water potential is denoted by the Greek letter psi, psi, and is expressed in units of pressure. Pressure is a form of energy, called megapascals, MPA. The potential of pure water, psi W pure H2O, is, by convenience of definition, designated a value of zero. Even though pure water contains plenty of potential energy, that energy is ignored. Water potential values for the water in a plant root, stem, or leaf are therefore expressed relative to psi W pure H2O. The water potential in plant solutions is influenced by solute concentration, pressure, gravity, and factors called matrix effects. Water potential can be broken down into its individual components using the following equation, where psi S, psi P, psi G, and psi M refer to the solute, pressure, gravity, and matric potentials, respectively. System, can refer to the water potential of the soil water, psi soil, root water, psi root, stem. Water, psi stem, leaf water, psi leaf, or the water in the atmosphere, psi atmosphere, whichever aqueous system is under consideration. As the individual components change, they raise or lower the total water potential of a system. When this happens, water moves to equilibrate, moving from the system or compartment with a higher water potential to the system or compartment with a lower water potential. This brings the difference in water potential between the two systems, dps, back to zero, dps equals zero. Therefore, for water to move through the plant from the soil to the air, a process called transpiration, psi soil must be greater than psi root greater than psi stem greater than psi leaf greater than psi atmosphere. Water only moves in response to dps, not in response to the individual components. However, because the individual components influence the total psi system, by manipulating the individual components, especially psi s, a plant can control water movement. Solute potential Solute potential, psi s, also called osmotic potential, is related to the solute concentration, in molarity. That relationship is given by the van t Hoff equation, psi s equals mirt where m is the molar concentration of the solute, i is the van t Hoff factor, the ratio of the amount of particles in the solution to amount of formula units dissolved, r is the ideal gas constant, and t is temperature in Kelvin degrees. 
The solute potential is negative in a plant cell and zero in distilled water. Typical values for cell cytoplasm are minus 0.5 to minus 1.0 MPa. Solutes reduce water potential, resulting in a negative psi W, by consuming some of the potential energy available in the water. Solute molecules can dissolve in water because water molecules can bind to them via hydrogen bonds. A hydrophobic molecule like oil, which cannot bind to water, cannot go into solution. The energy in the hydrogen bonds between solute molecules and water is no longer available to do work in the system because it is tied up in the bond. In other words, the amount of available potential energy is reduced when solutes are added to an aqueous system. Thus, psi s decreases with increasing solute concentration. Because psi s is one of the four components of psi system or psi total, a decrease in Psi S will cause a 850 Chapter 30, Plant Form and Physiology Access for free at OpenStax.org. Decrease in Psi Total. The internal water potential of a plant cell is more negative than pure water because of the cytoplasm's high solute content, figure 30.32. Because of this difference in water potential water will move from the soil into a plant's root cells via the process of osmosis. This is why solute potential is sometimes called osmotic potential. Plant cells can metabolically manipulate psi s, and by extension, psi total, by adding or removing solute molecules. Therefore, plants have control over psi total via their ability to exert metabolic control over psi s. Visual connection figure 30.32 In this example with a semi-permeable membrane between two aqueous systems, water will move from a region of higher to lower water potential until equilibrium is reached. Solutes, psi s, pressure, psi p, and gravity, psi g, influence total water potential for each side of the tube, psi total right or left, and therefore, the difference between psi total on each side, dps. Psi m, the potential due to interaction of water with solid substrates, is ignored in this example because glass is not especially hydrophilic. Water moves in response to the difference in water potential between two systems, the left and right sides of the tube. Positive water potential is placed on the left side of the tube by increasing psi p such that the water level rises on the right side. Could you equalize the water level on each side of the tube by adding solute, and if so, how? Pressure potential Pressure potential, psi p, also called turgor potential, may be positive or negative, figure 30.32. Because pressure is an expression of energy, the higher the pressure, the more potential energy in a system, and vice versa. Therefore, a positive psi p, compression, increases psi total, and a negative psi p, tension, decreases psi total. Positive pressure inside cells is contained by the cell wall, producing turgor pressure. Pressure potentials are typically around 0.6 to 0.8 MPa, but can reach as high as 1.5 MPa in a well-watered plant. A psi p of 1.5 MPa equates to 210 pounds per square inch. 1.5 MPa by 140 pounds, in 2 MPa minus 1 equals 210 pounds, IN2. As a comparison, most automobile tires are kept at a pressure of 30 to 34 psi. An example of the effect of turgor pressure is the wilting of leaves and their restoration after the plant has been watered, figure 30.33. Water is lost from the leaves via transpiration, approaching psi p equals 0 MPa at the wilting point and restored by uptake via the roots. A plant can manipulate psi p via its ability to manipulate psi s and by the process of osmosis. If a plant cell increases the cytoplasmic 30.5, transport of water and solutes in plants 851 solute concentration, psi s will decline, psi total will decline, the dps between the cell and the surrounding tissue will decline, water will move into the cell by osmosis, and psi p will increase. Psi p is also under indirect plant control via the opening and closing of stomata. Stomatal openings allow water to evaporate from the leaf, reducing psi p and psi total of the leaf and increasing psi between the water in the leaf and the petiole, thereby allowing water to flow from the petiole into the leaf. Figure 30.33 When a total water potential, psi total, is lower outside the cells than inside, water moves out of the cells and the plant wilts. When, b, the total water potential is higher outside the plant cells than inside, water moves into the cells, resulting in turgor pressure, psi p, and keeping the plant erect. 
Credit. Modification of work by Victor M. Vicente Selvas. Gravity potential gravity potential, psi g, is always negative to zero in a plant with no height. It always removes or consumes potential energy from the system. The force of gravity pulls water downwards to the soil, reducing the total amount of potential energy in the water in the plant, psi total. The taller the plant, the taller the water column, and the more influential psi g becomes. On a cellular scale and in short plants, this effect is negligible and easily ignored. However, over the height of a tall tree like a giant coastal redwood, the gravitational pull of minus 0.1 megapascals m1 is equivalent to an extra 1 megapascal of resistance that must be overcome for water to reach the leaves of the tallest trees. Plants are unable to manipulate psi g. Matric potential matric potential, psi m, is always negative to zero. In a dry system, it can be as low as minus 2 megapascals in a dry seed, and it is zero in a water-saturated system. The binding of water to a matrix always removes or consumes potential energy from the system. Psi m is similar to solute potential because it involves tying up the energy in an aqueous system by forming hydrogen bonds between the water and some other component. However, in solute potential, the other components are soluble, hydrophilic solute molecules, whereas in psi m, the other components are insoluble, hydrophilic molecules of the plant cell wall. Every plant cell has a cellulosic cell wall and the cellulose in the cell walls is hydrophilic, producing a matrix for adhesion of water, hence the name matric potential. Psi m is very large, negative, in dry tissues such as seeds or drought-affected soils. However, it quickly goes to zero as the seed takes up water or the soil hydrates. Psi m cannot be manipulated by the plant and is typically ignored in well-watered roots, stems, and leaves. Movement of water and minerals in the xylem solutes, pressure, gravity, and matric potential are all important for the transport of water in plants. Water moves from an area of higher total water potential, higher Gibbs free energy, to an area of lower total water potential. Gibbs free energy is the energy associated with a chemical reaction that can be used to do work. This is expressed as dps. Transpiration is the loss of water from the plant through evaporation at the leaf surface. It is the main driver of water movement in the xylem. Transpiration is caused by the evaporation of water at the leaf atmosphere interface. It creates negative pressure, tension, equivalent to minus 2 megapascals at the leaf surface. This value varies greatly depending on the vapor pressure deficit, which can be negligible at high relative humidity, RH, and substantial at low RH. Water from the roots is pulled up by this tension. At night, when stomata shut and transpiration stops, the water is held in the stem and leaf by the adhesion of water to the cell walls of the xylem vessels and tracheids, and the cohesion of water molecules to each other. This is called the cohesion tension theory of sap ascent. Inside the leaf at the cellular level, water on the surface of mesophyll cells saturates the cellulose microfibrils of the primary cell wall. The leaf contains many large intercellular air spaces for the exchange of oxygen for carbon dioxide, which is required for 852 Chapter 30, Plant Form and Physiology Access for free at OpenStax.org. Photosynthesis the wet cell wall is exposed to this leaf internal airspace, and the water on the surface of the cells evaporates into the airspaces, decreasing the thin film on the surface of the mesophyll cells. This decrease creates a greater tension on the water in the mesophyll cells, figure 30.34, thereby increasing the pull on the water in the xylem vessels. The xylem vessels and tracheids are structurally adapted to cope with large changes in pressure. Rings in the vessels maintain their tubular shape, much like the rings on a vacuum cleaner hose keep the hose open while it is under pressure. Small perforations between vessel elements reduce the number and size of gas bubbles that can form via a process called cavitation. The formation of gas bubbles in xylem interrupts the continuous stream of water from the base to the top of the plant, causing a break termed an embolism in the flow of xylem sap. The taller the tree, the greater the tension force is needed to pull water, and the more cavitation events. In larger trees, the resulting embolisms can plug xylem vessels, making them non-functional. Visual connection figure 30.34 The cohesion tension theory of sap ascent is shown. Evaporation from the mesophyll cells produces a negative water potential gradient that causes water to move upwards from the roots through the xylem. 
Which of the following statements is false? A. Negative water potential draws water into the root hairs. Cohesion and adhesion draw water up the xylem. Transpiration draws water from the leaf. B. Negative water potential draws water into the root hairs. Cohesion and adhesion draw water up the phloem. Transpiration draws water from the leaf. C. Water potential decreases from the roots to the top of the plant. D. Water enters the plants through root hairs and exits through stoma. Transpiration. The loss of water vapor to the atmosphere through stomata is a passive process, meaning that metabolic energy in the form of ATP is not required for water movement. The energy driving transpiration is the difference in energy between the water in the soil and the water in the atmosphere. However, transpiration is tightly controlled. 30.5. Transport of water and solutes in plants 853 Control of transpiration The atmosphere to which the leaf is exposed drives transpiration, but also causes massive water loss from the plant. Up to 90% of the water taken up by roots may be lost through transpiration. Leaves are covered by a waxy cuticle on the outer surface that prevents the loss of water. Regulation of transpiration, therefore, is achieved primarily through the opening and closing of stomata on the leaf surface. Stomata are surrounded by two specialized cells called guard cells, which open and close in response to environmental cues such as light intensity and quality, leaf water status, and carbon dioxide. Concentrations. Stomata must open to allow air containing carbon dioxide and oxygen to diffuse into the leaf for photosynthesis and respiration. When stomata are open, however, water vapor is lost to the external environment, increasing the rate of transpiration. Therefore, plants must maintain a balance between efficient photosynthesis and water loss. Plants have evolved over time to adapt to their local environment and reduce transpiration, figure 30.35. Desert plant, xerophytes, and plants that grow on other plants, epiphytes, have limited access to water. Such plants usually have a much thicker waxy cuticle than those growing in more moderate, well-watered environments, mesophytes. Aquatic plants, hydrophytes, also have their own set of anatomical and morphological leaf adaptations. Figure 30.35 plants are suited to their local environment. A. Xerophytes, like this prickly pear cactus, Apuntia sp. and b. Epiphytes such as this tropical Eschinanthus peroteti have adapted to very limited water resources. The leaves of a prickly pear are modified into spines, which lowers the surface to volume ratio and reduces water loss. Photosynthesis takes place in the stem, which also stores water. b. a. Peroteti leaves have a waxy cuticle that prevents water loss. c. Goldenrod, Solidago sp is a mesophyte, well suited for moderate environments. D. Hydrophytes, like this fragrant water lily, Nymphaea odorata, are adapted to thrive in aquatic environments. Credit A. Modification of work by John Sullivan. Credit B. Modification of work by L. Shyamal, Wikimedia Commons. Credit C. Modification of work by 854 Chapter 30, Plant Form and Physiology Access for free at OpenStax.org. Hugh Williams. Credit D. Modification of work by Jason Hollinger. Xerophytes and epiphytes often have a thick covering of trichomes or of stomata that are sunken below the leaf surface. Trichomes are specialized hair-like epidermal cells that secrete oils and substances. These adaptations impede airflow across the stomatal pore and reduce transpiration. Multiple epidermal layers are also commonly found in these types of plants. Transportation of photosynthates in the phloem plants need an energy source to grow. In seeds and bulbs, food is stored in polymers, such as starch, that are converted by metabolic processes into sucrose for newly developing plants. Once green shoots and leaves are growing, plants are able to produce their own food by photosynthesizing. The products of photosynthesis are called photosynthates, which are usually in the form of simple sugars such as sucrose. Structures that produce photosynthates for the growing plant are referred to as sources. Sugars produced in sources, such as leaves, need to be delivered to growing parts of the plant via the phloem in a process called translocation. The points of sugar delivery, such as roots, young shoots, and developing seeds, are called sinks. Seeds, tubers, and bulbs can be either a source or a sink, depending on the plant's stage of development and the season. The products from the source are usually translocated to the nearest sink through the phloem. 
For example, the highest leaves will send photosynthates upward to the growing shoot tip, whereas lower leaves will direct photosynthates downward to the roots. Intermediate leaves will send products in both directions, unlike the flow in the xylem, which is always unidirectional, soil to leaf to atmosphere. The pattern of photosynthate flow changes as the plant grows and develops. Photosynthates are directed primarily to the roots early on, to shoots and leaves during vegetative growth, and to seeds and fruits during reproductive development. They are also directed to tubers for storage. Translocation. Transport from source to sink photosynthates, such as sucrose, are produced in the mesophyll cells of photosynthesizing leaves. From there they are translocated through the phloem to where they are used or stored. Mesophyll cells are connected by cytoplasmic channels called plasmodesmata. Photosynthates move through these channels to reach phloem sieve tube elements, STEs, in the vascular bundles. From the mesophyll cells, the photosynthates are loaded into the phloem STEs. The sucrose is actively transported against its concentration gradient, a process requiring ATP, into the phloem cells using the electrochemical potential of the proton gradient. This is coupled to the uptake of sucrose with a carrier protein called the sucrose H plus symporter. Phloem STEs have reduced cytoplasmic contents and are connected by a sieve plate with pores that allow for pressure driven bulk flow or translocation of phloem sap. Companion cells are associated with STEs. They assist with metabolic activities and produce energy for the STEs. Figure 30.36. Figure 30.36 Phloem is comprised of cells called sieve tube elements. Phloem sap travels through perforations called sieve tube plates. 30.5 Transport of water and solutes in plants 855 neighboring companion cells carry out metabolic functions for the sieve tube elements and provide them with energy. Lateral sieve areas connect the sieve tube elements to the companion cells. Once in the phloem, the photosynthates are translocated to the closest sink. Phloem sap is an aqueous solution that contains up to 30% sugar, minerals, amino acids, and plant growth regulators. The high percentage of sugar decreases psi s, which decreases the total water potential and causes water to move by osmosis from the adjacent xylem into the phloem tubes, thereby increasing pressure. This increase in total water potential causes the bulk flow of phloem from source to sink, figure 30.37. Sucrose concentration in the sink cells is lower than in the phloem STEs because the sink sucrose has been metabolized for growth, or converted to starch for storage or other polymers, such as cellulose, for structural integrity. Unloading at the sink end of the phloem tube occurs by either diffusion or active transport of sucrose molecules from an area of high concentration to one of low concentration. Water diffuses from the phloem by osmosis and is then transpired or recycled via the xylem back into the phloem sap. Figure 30.37 Sucrose is actively transported from source cells into companion cells and then into the sieve tube elements. This reduces the water potential, which causes water to enter the phloem from the xylem. The resulting positive pressure forces the sucrose water mixture down toward the roots, where sucrose is unloaded. Transpiration causes water to return to the leaves through the xylem vessels. 30.6 Plant sensory systems and responses By the end of this section, you will be able to do the following. Describe how red and blue light affect plant growth and metabolic activities. Discuss gravitropism. Understand how hormones affect plant growth and development. Describe thigmotropism, thigmonastism, and thigmogenesis. Explain how plants defend themselves from predators and respond to wounds animals can respond to environmental factors by moving to a new location. Plants, however, are rooted in place and must respond to the surrounding environmental factors. Plants have sophisticated systems to detect and respond to light, gravity, temperature, and physical touch. Receptors sense environmental factors and relay the information to effector systems, often through intermediate chemical messengers, to bring about plant responses. Plant responses to light plants have a number of sophisticated uses for light that go far beyond their ability to photosynthesize low molecular weight sugars using only carbon dioxide, light, and water. Photomorphogenesis is the growth and development of plants in response to light. It allows plants to optimize their use of light in space. Photoperiodism is the ability to use light to track time. Plants 856 Chapter 30 Plant Form and Physiology Access for free at OpenStax.org
can tell the time of day and time of year by sensing and using various wavelengths of sunlight. Phototropism is a directional response that allows plants to grow towards, or even away from, light. The sensing of light in the environment is important to plants, it can be crucial for competition and survival. The response of plants to light is mediated by different photoreceptors, which are comprised of a protein covalently bonded to a light-absorbing pigment called a chromophore. Together, the two are called a chromoprotein. The red, far red and violet blue regions of the visible light spectrum trigger structural development in plants. Sensory photoreceptors absorb light in these particular regions of the visible light spectrum because of the quality of light available in the daylight spectrum. In terrestrial habitats, light absorption by chlorophylls peaks in the blue and red regions of the spectrum. As light filters through the canopy and the blue and red wavelengths are absorbed, the spectrum shifts to the far red end, shifting the plant community to those plants better adapted to respond to far red light. Blue light receptors allow plants to gauge the direction and abundance of sunlight, which is rich in blue-green emissions. Water absorbs red light, which makes the detection of blue light essential for algae and aquatic plants. The phytochrome system and the red, far red response The phytochromes are a family of chromoproteins with a linear tetraparole chromophore, similar to the ring tetraparole light-absorbing head group of chlorophyll. Phytochromes have two photo-interconvertible forms, PR and PFR. PR absorbs red light, approximately 667 nanometers, and is immediately converted to PFR. PFR absorbs far red light, approximately 730 nanometers, and is quickly converted back to PR. Absorption of red or far red light causes a massive change to the shape of the chromophore, altering the conformation and activity of the phytochrome protein to which it is bound. PFR is the physiologically active form of the protein. Therefore, exposure to red light yields physiological activity. Exposure to far red light inhibits phytochrome activity. Together, the two forms represent the phytochrome system, figure 30.38. The phytochrome system acts as a biological light switch. It monitors the level, intensity, duration, and color of environmental light. The effect of red light is reversible by immediately shining far red light on the sample which converts the chromoprotein to the inactive PR form. Additionally, PFR can slowly revert to PR in the dark, or break down over time. In all instances, the physiological response induced by red light is reversed. The active form of phytochrome, PFR, can directly activate other molecules in the cytoplasm, or it can be trafficked to the nucleus, where it directly activates or represses specific gene expression. Once the phytochrome system evolved, Plants adapted it to serve a variety of needs. Unfiltered, full sunlight contains much more red light than far red light. Because chlorophyll absorbs strongly in the red region of the visible spectrum, but not in the far red region, any plant in the shade of another plant on the forest floor will be exposed to red depleted, far red enriched light. The preponderance of far red light converts phytochrome in the shaded leaves to the PR, inactive, form, slowing growth. The nearest non-shaded, or even less shaded, areas on the forest floor have more red light. Leaves exposed to these areas sense the red light, which activates the PFR form and induces growth. In short, plant shoots use the phytochrome system to grow away from shade and towards light. Because competition for light is so fierce in a dense plant community, the evolutionary advantages of the phytochrome system are obvious. In seeds, the phytochrome system is not used to determine direction and quality of light, shaded versus unshaded. Instead, is it used merely to determine if there is any light at all. This is especially important in species with very small seeds, such as lettuce. Because of their size, lettuce seeds have few food reserves. Their seedlings cannot grow for long before they run out of fuel. If they germinated even a centimeter under the soil surface, the seedling would never make it into the sunlight and would die. In the dark, phytochrome is in the PR, inactive form, and the seed will not germinate. It will only germinate if exposed to light at the surface of the soil. Upon exposure to light, PR is converted to PFR and germination proceeds. 30.6 Plant Sensory Systems N. Responses 857 Figure 30.38 The biologically inactive form of phytochrome, PR is converted to the biologically active form PFR under illumination with red light. 
Far red light and darkness convert the molecule back to the inactive form. Plants also use the phytochrome system to sense the change of season. Photoperiodism is a biological response to the timing and duration of day and night. It controls flowering, setting of winter buds, and vegetative growth. Detection of seasonal changes is crucial to plant survival. Although temperature and light intensity influence plant growth, they are not reliable indicators of season because they may vary from one year to the next. Day length is a better indicator of the time of year. As stated above, unfiltered sunlight is rich in red light but deficient in far red light. Therefore, at dawn, all the phytochrome molecules in a leaf quickly convert to the active PFR form and remain in that form until sunset. In the dark, the PFR form takes hours to slowly revert back to the PR form. If the night is long, as in winter, all of the PFR form reverts. If the night is short, as in summer, a considerable amount of PFR may remain at sunrise. By sensing the PR PFR ratio at dawn, a plant can determine the length of the day night cycle. In addition, leaves retain that information for several days, allowing a comparison between the length of the previous night and the preceding several nights. Shorter nights indicate springtime to the plant. When the nights become longer, autumn is approaching. This information, along with sensing temperature and water availability, allows plants to determine the time of the year and adjust their physiology accordingly. Short day, long night, plants use this information to flower in the late summer and early fall, when nights exceed a critical length, often eight or fewer hours. Long day, short night, plants flower during the spring, when darkness is less than a critical length, often eight to fifteen hours. Not all plants use the phytochrome system in this way. Flowering in day neutral plants is not regulated by day length. Career connection horticulturalist The word, horticulturist, comes from the Latin words for garden, hortus, and culture, cultura. This career has been revolutionized by progress made in the understanding of plant responses to environmental stimuli. Growers of crops, fruit, vegetables, and flowers were previously constrained by having to time their sowing and harvesting according to the season. Now, horticulturists can manipulate plants to increase leaf, flower, or fruit production by understanding how environmental factors affect plant growth and development. Greenhouse management is an essential component of a horticulturist's education. To lengthen the night, plants are covered with a blackout shade cloth. Long day plants are irradiated with red light in winter to promote early flowering. For example, fluorescent, cool, white, light high in blue wavelengths encourages leafy growth and is excellent for starting seedlings. Incandescent lamps, standard light bulbs, are rich in red light and promote flowering in some plants. The timing of fruit ripening can be increased or delayed by applying plant hormones. Recently, considerable progress has been made in the development of plant breeds that are suited to different climates and resistant to pests and transportation damage. Both crop yield and quality have increased as a result of practical applications of the knowledge of plant responses to external stimuli and hormones. Horticulturists find employment in private and governmental laboratories, greenhouses, botanical gardens, and in the production or research fields. They improve crops by applying their knowledge of genetics and plant physiology. To prepare for a horticulture career, students take classes in botany, plant physiology, plant pathology, landscape design, and plant breeding. To 858 Chapter 30, Plant Form and Physiology Access for free at OpenStax.org. Complement these traditional courses, horticulture majors add studies in economics, business, computer science, and communications. The blue light responses phototropism, the directional bending of a plant toward or away from a light source, is a response to blue wavelengths of light. Positive phototropism is growth towards a light source, figure 30.39, while negative phototropism, also called scototropism, is growth away from light. The aptly named phototropines are protein-based receptors responsible for mediating the phototropic response. Like all plant photoreceptors, phototropines consist of a protein portion and a light-absorbing portion, called the chromophore. In phototropines, the chromophore is a covalently bound molecule of flavin. Hence, phototropines belong to a class of proteins called flavoproteins. Other responses under the control of phototropines are leaf opening and closing, chloroplast movement, and the opening of stomata. However, of all responses controlled by phototropines, 
Phototropism has been studied the longest and is the best understood. In their 1880 treatise The Power of Movements in Plants, Charles Darwin and his son Francis first described phototropism as the bending of seedlings toward light. Darwin observed that light was perceived by the tip of the plant, the apical meristem, but that the response, bending, took place in a different part of the plant. They concluded that the signal had to travel from the apical meristem to the base of the plant. Figure 30.39 Azure Bluets, Houstonia carulia, display a phototropic response by bending toward the light. Credit. Corey Zanker, in 1913, Peter Boyson Jensen demonstrated that a chemical signal produced in the plant tip was responsible for the bending at the base. He cut off the tip of a seedling, covered the cut section with a layer of gelatin, and then replaced the tip. The seedling bent toward the light when illuminated. However, when impermeable mica flakes were inserted between the tip and the cut base, the seedling did not bend. A refinement of the experiment showed that the signal traveled on the shaded side of the seedling. When the mica plate was inserted on the illuminated side, the plant did bend towards the light. Therefore, the chemical signal was a growth stimulant because the phototropic response involved faster cell elongation on the shaded side than on the illuminated side. We now know that as light passes through a plant stem, it is diffracted and generates phototropin activation across the stem. Most activation occurs on the lit side. Causing the plant hormone indole acetic acid, IAA, to accumulate on the shaded side. Stem cells elongate under influence of IAA. Cryptochromes are another class of blue light absorbing photoreceptors that also contain a flavin based chromophore. Cryptochromes set the plant's 24 hour activity cycle, also known as its circadian rhythm, using blue light cues. There is some evidence that cryptochromes work together with phototropines to mediate the phototropic response. Link to learning use the navigation menu in the left panel of this website, http colon slash slash openstacks.org slash l slash plnts underscore n underscore motion closing parenthesis to view images of plants in 30.6, plant sensory systems and responses 859 motion. Plant responses to gravity whether or not they germinate in the light or in total darkness, shoots usually sprout up from the ground, and roots grow downward into the ground. A plant laid on its side in the dark will send shoots upward when given enough time. Gravitropism ensures that roots grow into the soil and that shoots grow toward sunlight. Growth of the shoot apical tip upward is called negative gravitropism, whereas growth of the roots downward is called positive gravitropism. Amyloplasts, also known as statiliths, are specialized plastids that contain starch granules and settle downward in response to gravity. Amyloplasts are found in shoots and in specialized cells of the root cap. When a plant is tilted, the statiliths drop to the new bottom cell wall. A few hours later, the shoot or root will show growth in the new vertical direction. The mechanism that mediates gravitropism is reasonably well understood. When amyloplasts settle to the bottom of the gravity sensing cells in the root or shoot, they physically contact the endoplasmic reticulum, ER, causing the release of calcium ions from inside the ER. This calcium signaling in the cells causes polar transport of the plant hormone IAA to the bottom of the cell. In roots, a high concentration of IAA inhibits cell elongation. The effect slows growth on the lower side of the root, while cells develop normally on the upper side. IAA has the opposite effect in shoots, where a higher concentration at the lower side of the shoot stimulates cell expansion, causing the shoot to grow up. After the shoot or root begin to grow, Vertically, the amyloplasts return to their normal position. Other hypotheses, involving the entire cell in the gravitropism effect, have been proposed to explain why some mutants that lack amyloplasts may still exhibit a weak gravitropic response. Growth responses A plant's sensory response to external stimuli relies on chemical messengers, hormones. Plant hormones affect all aspects of plant life, from flowering to fruit setting and maturation, and from phototropism to leaf fall. Potentially every cell in a plant can produce plant hormones. They can act in their cell of origin or be transported to other portions of the plant body, with many plant responses involving the synergistic or antagonistic interaction of two or more hormones. In contrast, animal hormones are produced in specific glands and transported to a distant site for action, and they act alone. Plant hormones are a group of unrelated chemical substances that affect plant morphogenesis. 
Five major plant hormones are traditionally described. Auxins, particularly IAA, cytokinins, gibberellins, ethylene, and abscisic acid. In addition, other nutrients and environmental conditions can be characterized as growth factors. Auxins The term auxin is derived from the Greek word auxion, which means to grow. Auxins are the main hormones responsible for cell elongation in phototropism and gravitropism. They also control the differentiation of meristem into vascular tissue, and promote leaf development and arrangement. While many synthetic auxins are used as herbicides, IAA is the only naturally occurring auxin that shows physiological activity. Apical dominance, the inhibition of lateral bud formation, is triggered by auxins produced in the apical meristem. Flowering, fruit setting and ripening, and inhibition of abscission, leaf falling, are other plant responses under the direct or indirect control of auxins. Auxins also act as a relay for the effects of the blue light and red, far red responses. Commercial use of auxins is widespread in plant nurseries and for crop production. IAA is used as a rooting hormone to promote growth of adventitious roots on cuttings and detached leaves. Applying synthetic auxins to tomato plants in greenhouses promotes normal fruit development. Outdoor application of auxin promotes synchronization of fruit setting and dropping to coordinate the harvesting season. Fruits such as seedless cucumbers can be induced to set fruit by treating unfertilized plant flowers with auxins. Cytokinins The effect of cytokinins was first reported when it was found that adding the liquid endosperm of coconuts to developing plant embryos in culture stimulated their growth. The stimulating growth factor was found to be cytokinin, a hormone that promotes cytokinesis, cell division. Almost 200 naturally occurring or synthetic cytokinins are known to date. Cytokinins are most abundant in growing tissues, such as roots, embryos, and fruits, where cell division is occurring. Cytokinins are known to delay senescence in leaf tissues, promote mitosis, and stimulate differentiation of the meristem in shoots and roots. Many effects on plant development are under the influence of cytokinins, either in conjunction with auxin or another hormone. For example, Apical dominance seems to result from a balance between auxins that inhibit lateral buds, and cytokinins that promote bushier 860 Chapter 30, Plant Form and Physiology Access for free at OpenStax.org. Growth. Gibberellins Gibberellins, gas, are a group of about 125 closely related plant hormones that stimulate shoot elongation, seed germination, and fruit and flower maturation. Gas are synthesized in the root and stem apical meristems, young leaves, and seed embryos. In urban areas, GA antagonists are sometimes applied to trees under power lines to control growth and reduce the frequency of pruning. Gas break dormancy, a state of inhibited growth and development, in the seeds of plants that require exposure to cold or light to germinate. Abscisic acid is a strong antagonist of GA action. Other effects of gas include gender expression, seedless fruit development, and the delay of senescence in leaves and fruit. Seedless grapes are obtained through standard breeding methods and contain inconspicuous seeds that fail to develop. Because gas are produced by the seeds, and because fruit development and stem elongation are under GA control, these varieties of grapes would normally produce small fruit in compact clusters. Maturing grapes are routinely treated with GA to promote larger fruit size, as well as looser bunches, longer stems, which reduces the instance of mildew infection, figure 30.40. Figure 30.40 in grapes, application of gibberellic acid increases the size of fruit and loosens clustering. Credit. Bob Nichols, USDA, abscisic acid The plant hormone abscisic acid, ABA, was first discovered as the agent that causes the abscission or dropping of cotton bowls. However, more recent studies indicate that ABBA plays only a minor role in the abscission process. ABBA accumulates as a response to stressful environmental conditions, such as dehydration, cold temperatures, or shortened day lengths. Its activity counters many of the growth-promoting effects of gas and auxins. ABBA inhibits stem elongation and induces dormancy in lateral buds. ABBA induces dormancy in seeds by blocking germination and promoting the synthesis of storage proteins. Plants adapted to temperate climates require a long period of cold temperature before seeds germinate. This mechanism protects young plants from sprouting too early during unseasonably warm weather in winter. As the hormone gradually breaks down over winter, 
the seed is released from dormancy and germinates when conditions are favorable in spring. Another effect of ABBA is to promote the development of winter buds, it mediates the conversion of the apical meristem into a dormant bud. Low soil moisture causes an increase in ABBA, which causes stomata to close, reducing water loss in winter buds. 30.6 Plant sensory systems and responses 861 Ethylene Ethylene is associated with fruit ripening, flower wilting, and leaf fall. Ethylene is unusual because it is a volatile gas, C2H4. Hundreds of years ago, when gas street lamps were installed in city streets, trees that grew close to lamp posts developed twisted, thickened trunks and shed their leaves earlier than expected. These effects were caused by ethylene volatilizing from the lamps. Aging tissues, especially senescing leaves, and nodes of stems produce ethylene. The best known effect of the hormone, however, is the promotion of fruit ripening. Ethylene stimulates the conversion of starch and acids to sugars. Some people store unripe fruit, such as avocados, in a sealed paper bag to accelerate ripening. The gas released by the first fruit to mature will speed up the maturation of the remaining fruit. Ethylene also triggers leaf and fruit abscission, flower fading and dropping, and promotes germination in some cereals and sprouting of bulbs and potatoes. Ethylene is widely used in agriculture. Commercial fruit growers control the timing of fruit ripening with application of the gas. Horticulturalists inhibit leaf dropping in ornamental plants by removing ethylene from greenhouses using fans and ventilation. Non-traditional hormones recent research has discovered a number of compounds that also influence plant development. Their roles are less understood than the effects of the major hormones described so far. Jasminates play a major role in defense responses to herbivora. Their levels increase when a plant is wounded by a predator, resulting in an increase in toxic secondary metabolites. They contribute to the production of volatile compounds that attract natural enemies of predators. For example, chewing of tomato plants by caterpillars leads to an increase in jasmonic acid levels, which in turn triggers the release of volatile compounds that attract predators of the pest. Oligosaccharins also play a role in plant defense against bacterial and fungal infections. They act locally at the site of injury, and can also be transported to other tissues. Strigolactones promote seed germination in some species and inhibit lateral apical development in the absence of auxins. Strigolactones also play a role in the establishment of mycorrhizae, a mutualistic association of plant roots and fungi. Brassinosteroids are important to many developmental and physiological processes. Signals between these compounds and other hormones, notably auxin and gas, amplifies their physiological effect. Apical dominance, seed germination, gravitropism, and resistance to freezing are all positively influenced by hormones. Root growth and fruit dropping are inhibited by steroids. Plant responses to wind and touch the shoot of a pea plant winds around a trellis, while a tree grows on an angle in response to strong prevailing winds. These are examples of how plants respond to touch or wind. The movement of a plant subjected to constant directional pressure is called thigmotropism, from the Greek words thigma meaning touch and tropism implying direction. Tendrils are one example of this. The meristematic region of tendrils is very touch sensitive. Light touch will evoke a quick coiling response. Cells in contact with a support surface contract whereas cells on the opposite side of the support expand, figure 30.14. Application of jasmonic acid is sufficient to trigger tendril coiling without a mechanical stimulus. A thigmonastic response is a touch response independent of the direction of stimulus figure 30.24. In the Venus flytrap, two modified leaves are joined at a hinge and lined with thin fork-like tines along the outer edges. Tiny hairs are located inside the trap. When an insect brushes against these trigger hairs, touching two or more of them in succession, the leaves close quickly, trapping the prey. Glands on the leaf surface secrete enzymes that slowly digest the insect. The released nutrients are absorbed by the leaves, which reopen for the next meal. Thigmomorphogenesis is a slow developmental change in the shape of a plant subjected to continuous mechanical stress. When trees bend in the wind, for example, growth is usually stunted and the trunk thickens. Strengthening tissue, especially xylem, is produced to add stiffness to resist the wind's force. Researchers hypothesize that mechanical strain induces growth and differentiation to strengthen the tissues. 
Ethylene and jasminate are likely involved in thigmomorphogenesis. Link to learning use the menu at the left to navigate to three short movies. HTTP colon slash slash openstacks.org slash L slash Nastic underscore MVMT closing parenthesis a Venus fly trap capturing prey, the progressive closing of sensitive plant leaflets, and the twining of tendrils. 862 Chapter 30, Plant Form and Physiology Access for Free at openstacks.org. Defense responses against herbivores and pathogens plants face two types of enemies, herbivores and pathogens. Herbivores both large and small use plants as food, and actively chew them. Pathogens are agents of disease. These infectious microorganisms, such as fungi, bacteria, and nematodes, live off of the plant and damage its tissues. Plants have developed a variety of strategies to discourage or kill attackers. The first line of defense in plants is an intact and impenetrable barrier. Bark and the waxy cuticle can protect against predators. Other adaptations against herbivora include thorns, which are modified branches, and spines, which are modified leaves. They discourage animals by causing physical damage and inducing rashes and allergic reactions. A plant's exterior protection can be compromised by mechanical damage, which may provide an entry point for pathogens. If the first line of defense is breached, the plant must resort to a different set of defense mechanisms, such as toxins and enzymes. Secondary metabolites are compounds that are not directly derived from photosynthesis and are not necessary for respiration or plant growth and development. Many metabolites are toxic, and can even be lethal to animals that ingest them. Some metabolites are alkaloids, which discourage predators with noxious odors, such as the volatile oils of mint and sage, or repellent tastes, like the bitterness of quinine. Other alkaloids affect herbivores by causing either excessive stimulation, caffeine as one example, or the lethargy associated with opioids. Some compounds become toxic after ingestion. For instance, glycol cyanide in the cassava root releases cyanide only upon ingestion. The nearly 500 million humans who rely on cassava for nutrition must be certain to process the root properly before eating. Mechanical wounding and predator attacks activate defense and protection mechanisms both in the damaged tissue and at sites farther from the injury location. Some defense reactions occur within minutes, others over several hours. The infected and surrounding cells may die, thereby stopping the spread of infection. Long-distance signaling elicits a systemic response aimed at deterring the predator. As tissue is damaged, jasminates may promote the synthesis of compounds that are toxic to predators. Jasminates also elicit the synthesis of volatile compounds that attract parasitoids, which are insects that spend their developing stages in or on another insect, and eventually kill their host. The plant may activate abscission of injured tissue if it is damaged beyond repair. 